In this video I want to give you a top secret technique invented 700 years ago for adding a certain ineffable mysterious factor X to your novel. It's called hexiety, which is Latin for thisness, and it was invented by a chap called a Franciscan friar called John Duns Scotus, who lived down the road from me in Oxford 700 years ago. Thisness makes your prose really sparkle. It's the difference between this and this. So, so welcome to another instalment in my series on how to write your novel using that most unlikely of writing implements, a round Oxford bus ticket. So for some inspiration we will take the bus down to the high street and try to travel back in time to 1288 when John Dunscote is to arrive in Oxford as a man in his early twenties. This beautiful church on the left, the University Church of St Mary the Virgin, would have been around then but not much else would have been. I'm grateful to New Yorker columnist James Wood for making me aware of thisness which he describes in his book How Fiction Works. He defines it as any detail that draws abstraction to itself and seems to kill that abstraction with the puff of palpability. As an example, he cites the observation recorded by George Orwell in his essay A Hanging about a condemned man being led to the gallows who stepped aside to avoid a puddle. Raymond Chandler was a master at this, she smelled the way the Taj Mahal looks by moonlight. I called him from a phone booth. The voice that answered was fat. It wheezed softly, like the voice of a man who had just won a pie-eating contest. Dead men are heavier than broken hearts. Now you don't have to be quite that flamboyant. The simplest approach is just to provide lots of specifying detail. Which is to say, don't tell me the private detective drove a car. Tell me he drove a 1942 Cadillac with white wheels. And there's a good reason for this. Because when we write fiction, we create a, a guided dream in the reader's mind. And the more detail you give, the more palpable and visible the dream becomes. So I'm going to try this now with Dun Scotus. Because although his theological writings are well known, there's very little known about his personal life. So we're going to make him palpable. We're going to go back to the day he met Honeysuckle. Who? Ah, wait and see. And if there are any medieval scholars watching, look, I'm sorry, OK? Oxford in 1288. The streets teem and wriggle with life like a cheese filled with maggots. Merchants and tradesmen and jugglers and acrobats and storytellers, girls selling flowers, girls selling pies a vast seething mass of tick-infested soap dodgers who wash their underwear once a year, and instead of personal laundry detergent they use human urine. Boys with sticks drive dung-smeared oxen down the street. The smell of excrement from open cesspits fills the air and vies with the sweeter reek of mutton pies, wood smoke, pig farts and freshly baked bread. Cockroaches are bound and the rats are so bold they wear silk trousers. Even the mice complain about the overcrowding. John Dunscotus walks through the shouting, bustling melee, wearing a habit of coarse, undyed wool. Just then a mad dog bites the testicles of one of the oxen. OK, I know oxen are castrated, but this one hasn't been done yet. The ox stampedes and knocks Dunscotus over. He is helped into the herbalist shop, and there she is, Honeysuckle, the daughter of the herbalist. In the dim interior of the shop, her loveliness gleams like a candle on the Virgin Mary's bedside table. The shop is dark and filled with shiny objects like a robber's cave. Glass jars filled with willow bark, comfrey root, Slippery elm, cinnamon, cloves, ginger. The intoxicating reek of frankincense, myrrh and pine resin fills his nostrils. Honeysuckle takes calendula, yarrow and marshmallow root 
and makes an ointment for John's wound. She binds his head, she chafes his temple, her hand is cool and soothing, like the hand of an alabaster saint. John Dunscotus looks at her helplessly. Her eyes are like two deep pools in a forest, next to which stands a sign saying, No swimming. Her hair is a glistening waterfall of silk. Even her ticks are cute. Honeysuckle notices a stain on Dunscotus's habit, which he acquired when he fell in the street. He's got a dirty habit. So she goes out to the back to fetch the 13th century equivalent of Purcell washing powder. And we hear the sweetest tinkling sound, like an angel playing a piccolo. And then she comes back in, carrying a chamber pot, and she washes out the stain from Dunscotus's habit. Don Scotus leaves with his head spinning, and as he does, Honeysuckle gives him a flower, a forget-me-not. He returns to the friary and puts a flower in a vase. He is aware that a deep unease has taken abode in his heart. He longs to see her again, but it is impossible for a man in his position. Ah, but the human heart is a wily old fox, isn't it? He conceives the idea of repaying her kindness by teaching her to read and write. And this he does. Honeysuckle becomes his pupil. She becomes a familiar sight in the neighbourhood of the friary, and all goes well until her belly begins to swell. Scandalous rumours and tittle-dattle begin to circulate, whereupon the black-hearted schemer, Brother Tobias, who hates Dunscotus, tells a lie to the guardian of the friary. He tells him he overheard Dunscotus boasting that he was the father of Honeysuckle's child. So Dunscotus is banished. He travels to Paris to further his theological studies. Meanwhile, back in Oxford, the butcher's assistant, Jack, turns up at the friary and confides to the guardian that he is the man responsible for Honeysuckle's condition, not Dunscotus. Brother Tobias is confronted with this revelation. He confesses and flees. We cut now to Dun Scotus in his little study in Paris. He receives a letter from the Guardian relating these events and begging for forgiveness. But there is another letter too. It is from Honeysuckle. Dear Dunny, she says, thank you for the money. I gave it to the butcher's assistant as you instructed. And he told the Guardian that it was he who got me up the duff. Your son Johannes is beginning to walk now. We think of you every day. I know it would be the ruin of you if the truth were ever revealed, and I swear your secret will always be safe with me, even though it will mean Johannes and I will live and die in poverty. Loving you always, Honeysuckle. Dun Scotus folds a letter and opens his Bible, and there, pressed between its leaves, is the forget-me-not. He puts the letter next to it and closes the Bible. And for a while there is silence, save the squeaking of a mouse in the skirting board. Ah, but there is no mouse. It is the sound of Dun Scotus weeping. <laughs> and if you would like to add Factor X to your novel, don't forget to download my free e-course on how to write your first novel, called Gateway to Narnia. The link is in the description below.